Welcome to the Equestrian Experience, a show where we talk about what happens behind the rosettes and what we've tried so that you don't have to. In a world first, we and our guests openly share what we know from our extensive equestrian experience. This includes our exclusive access to our global experts such as high-performance national vets, coaches, farriers and even brands. If you're new here, consider subscribing. We're your hosts, Amanda Ross and Bex Mason, and today we're talking to Sarah Cop Colhoun from Leader Equine. Welcome, Sarah Jane. It is amazing to have you on the podcast. Thank you. And hey, Bex, how are you? I'm really well, thank you. I'm looking forward to chatting to Sarah Jane today about all these cool equestrian products, and I've got a few questions of my own as well. So, yeah, let's crack on. Hi. I can't wait because, Bex, you're in the middle of winter and in Australia yeah. we're in the middle of summer. And so, Sarah Jane, you can answer for both weather stations about every product that you have there. And I bet you you can cover the whole lot because they're from Ireland. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so should we just start off by giving our listeners a little bit of your background, Sarah Jane? Um, can you tell us where it all started, where you're from? I can tell by your accent you're not actually from Australia. So do you want us to begin there? Yeah, sure. So, no, I'm, I'm not from Australia originally. I uh, grew up in Ireland, the most northerly point of Ireland, right in the wilds of the North Atlantic. Um, plenty of cold weather, wind and rain. Very familiar with that weather. Um, <laughs> horses I have loved from the get-go. There is a photograph floating around somewhere of me having been plonked onto a cousin's pony at 18 months old, and I apparently refused to get off and cried when they tried to get me <laughs> off. Yay. So it was, <laughs> like, just, yeah, it's always been there, but maybe not with um uh maybe not as professional as some others uh in the yeah. wilds of um Donegal and that. But yes, always had an interest in horses and um growing up with ponies and things like that on the farm. Well that's it. In Ireland, that's what I've always known. As soon as I heard your accent, I was like, Oh well of course it must have started back there in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> Who in Ireland no. hasn't ridden the horses in my eyes? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So where did your career start? From riding going plonked on a horse when you were like eighteen months old, where did it progress from there? Well, in terms of riding, I wouldn't say it was a career as much as a very passionate hobby. Um, but I just, I got lessons wherever I could. There weren't a lot of riding schools around growing up, but I got lessons as much as I could. And then my dad uh, was talking to somebody who was, mo was their kid was giving up riding and they had a Connemara pony. She wasn't expensive. So she appeared at home and uh, I had to still try very hard to get lessons because he thought once I had a pony, there was no need for lessons. Um, <laughs> I'm now paying for that <laughs> at, a, at this stage of my life, trying to be a much better rider. But uh, yeah, the ponies, um, as much as I could as a kid and a teenager, and then um, I did feel like I needed to have a proper career, as in I didn't think I'd be very successful on the horse end of things. So I went down the um, PE teaching, physical education teaching oh. route. And it was during that educational uh, fun that I did a year out traveling and working around Australia. Oh. Uh, I think I was about 20 at the time. And every time I had time off from my various jobs, I would find somewhere to ride. And when I came home to Ireland, I said, that's it. I'm, I have to do something with horses. And um, I went to college, did a business, uh, equine science with business management degree um, at Enniskillen College uh, in Northern Ireland. And there I got introduced to all manner of professional things with horses, be that stud management, breeding, racehorses. We had our own point to point racing yard in the college. Oh, wow. Um, we could learn to ride racehorses, uh, ride work, school over fences um, and uh everything that goes along with that, including going for your license if you wanted to be a point-to-point -point jockey. God. <clears throat> and, um, which I did manage to did succeed you? at. Uh, I got my license. <laughs> oh, my God. Did, did you uh, did you ride in races? Yes, I did a few. Yes, oh, I did. I, I got oh, fantastic. Season. Wow. Is it as crazy it. scary as it looks? Let you, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I would far rather. I still think I would actually prefer right now, having not ridden properly track work in about 
it must be 12 years now, but I still think I would prefer to get on a racehorse and ride over fences in a point to point than I would go out facing a cross country course at a three day event. <laughs> so, really? <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, it is like it, it is extreme, I suppose. Um, but I think like anything, if you've got a good horse, it doesn't feel so extreme. Mm, um, but okay. there, yes, I'm, it's something that I absolutely love to go to. It's such a buzz and, um, just so enjoyed it. Those horses are just incredible. Um, and I was riding point pointers and other people would say, you know, you ride a top class national hunt horse and they're a whole other ball game, but, um, really, it's, uh, yeah, point pointing is a big thing. I suppose Bex, you would find that in the UK. Point pointing is a big. Thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, point pointing is a big thing. It's a big social thing over yeah. here as well to go and watch yeah. them on the days out all throughout the season. Um, but as you're saying, it's going, going cross country. The, the fences don't knock down. I think the point to pointing, you're kind of, and your adrenaline's up. You're going you can brush through on these athletes. <laughs> <laughs> you can try and rush through and uh yeah so no, look, i did i had a lot of fun doing that uh for a time and even when i left and i all actually college was brilliant because we had an opportunity to do uh, a year's worth of placement so we could go off and i managed to travel to south africa worked on stud farms and a racing yard they're one of the top trainers in cape town i worked for oh, wow. loads of really good experience mm -hmm. um and then i did yearling sales in germany and then back to the curra which is the home of racing in ireland really and oh. um, rode out trainers there and by the time i went back to college i was pretty set right no i'm going to do this racing thing um for fun more so than anything before i think about a real career down the track and i did have my fun for a few years and then i said maybe i should look for something that um, uh -huh. is a bit safer <laughs> yeah, I, I started in retail with a, um, a an equestrian and pet retail store, and they're mm -hmm. like in Australia they'd be like pet barn, except mm -hmm. half the shop is equestrian. Oh wow! Um, or like in the UK, like pets at home, but half your shop is equestrian. And I did that for a yeah. couple of years. I became a manager in the store there, so I got to work with um, all of the products, all the equestrian brands, getting mm -hmm. to know our customer base and just meeting lots of people like me who just loved horses mm. and animals it must be really interesting meeting everybody from all different backgrounds all different walks of life and all different types of horses you know you have the more professional people you have the more amateur people people that are just starting out and people that have been in it for a long time and these products are constantly developing aren't they absolutely. oh absolutely and you have to you almost need like a slightly different persona when you're dealing with your different clientele and um, making sure that you've got, you know, you do, you have to have your basics and you've got to have your nice products and your more technical stuff or whatever it might be. Um, and it was actually in that, that store actually had, they had like, a, they had three stores and I was doing a lot of the equestrian purchasing for the three stores. Mm -hmm. So I, then I was working very closely with a lot of the brands that we worked with, including Horseware Ireland. Mm -hmm. And it was that relationship that led to um, me being offered a job to work with Horseware uh, oh. while I was in Ireland. Yeah. And um, that was even its own journey in itself. I had a few different roles while I was there. Um, I, was there I think it was there about five years. Um, yeah, but I worked in their UK uh, market in the customer service and sales side of things mm -hmm. and then I also had a role um, as a category planner so working with all the different business managers in the different uh, markets and countries around the world and working out what products were needed for those markets and what mm -hmm. didn't suit and you know that sort of thing which was always really interesting and that meant working really closely with the research and development team as well yeah um, which I loved and uh, but I also looked after the uh, Australian uh, country, uh, like as in the um, distributor for Australia at the time, mm -hmm. and I looked after other countries. And it was that's actually what led me to end up in mm -hmm. Australia was working with them. And I came down to meet them and um, check out Equitana. And, uh, and then it all, all uh, came all came back to Australia, and then it started from here. My God, yes. Pretty that is much. incredibly yeah. global. I, I mean, I have known you now for quite some years through, you know, my involvement with with horseware and leader equine, and I had no idea 
that you had such an extensive global experience in all of these different facets. You have hidden that well. <laughs> I'm quite shy, Amanda. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm realising more shy than I thought. So, so obviously, like, what made you join Leader Equine in Australia? Like, what's the what was the best part about that job that drew you to to live here? Well, to be honest, first thing was meeting the the team. It's a family, like Leader Equine is a family owned business, and mm-hmm. meeting the team when I first came down. I mean, I was. I, I came down to go to I when we went to Adelaide. They took me to Adelaide three day event so I could check that out, and then we went we went to Equitana, and over the course of that week, we just we never stopped talking and and uh, really passionate about um, horses, about the brand. At that particular time, it was just Horse Rare Ireland that we were working with um, mm-hmm. under the lead by name, and um, just I really got on really well with them and. Uh, they started saying things like, well, do you like to travel? Would you like an adventure? Would you like to move, come to Australia for a while? And I have always loved travel. And I was like, yeah. oh, that would be so cool. Um, my husband's a, a farrier, and I was, that was my only concern was whether or not he'd go for it. And I did, at the time, I mentioned it to them, and they were like, a farrier, he will be fine in Australia. <laughs> we love farriers. Melbourne mm. need, needs farriers. So um, first and foremost, it was people. And I think that's um, that's really important. And it was just the the opportunity to build something or, or drive something forward and um, really develop the business here. That was mm. very exciting um, and mm-hmm. a really lovely opportunity for me to get. Wow. And you've, you've obviously got such experience with, you know, so many different products across so many different brands. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the products that Leader Equine um, manufactures or sells and distributes um, and what you think um, make them different to others? So let's start with one of my favourites, the Ice Vibes. So these are uh, a wraparound boot that go over a um, an icy cell that you keep in the freezer, and they also have a rating panel that you can insert into the boot, which has a 20 minute timer. Um, so, what do you feel, Sarah Jane, are the benefits of using ice boots? I so love that you've started with that product because it's the one I tell everybody that I meet. I'm like, this, if you buy nothing else from me, <laughs> please, please take some ice vibes. Mm-hmm. They're the piece of kit that every Every rider, every horse owner, actually, um, you don't have to be riding all the time. Uh, every every horse owner should have a pair of ice vibes. The reason I love them is that they combine two things, and there's there really isn't anything else like them on the market that is as easy to use. So they're combining the cooling, cold circulation therapy. They continue to move the blood around the leg. The mm-hmm. reason this is important is that when ice vibes are not looking to replace your normal ice boot. They're not mm-hmm. looking to stop circulation. They're not looking to like just purely ice. What they're looking to do is move blood flow up and down the leg, move lymph out of the leg, bring oxygen and nutrients into the cells and tissue. Mm-hmm. Um, and they do this really well just with their, with when you combine the vibration panel with the cold packs. They're really versatile in that you don't have to have your horse tied up if you don't want to. Mm-hmm. And you can have them all walking the horse if needs be. You can have them on and the horse can go for a roll and it's not going to be a big deal. Um, and you can use them without the cold pack so that you're getting the um, massage or the vibration um, yeah. effect on the legs uh, without the cooling. So I actually typically use them before I ride to warm up the legs of the horses that I'm wearing. And, it, and it's the thing we sometimes forget um, that horses' lower legs have no muscles, so there is a lot less vascular blood flow going on in the lower leg of a horse. It's all white connective tissue, tendons and ligaments and that sort of thing. And when we ice big muscle groups, the blood flow returns really quickly to normal, but with lower legs, when it's just really tendons and ligaments, it's really hard to get blood flow back to normal in there. And the whole time that we're not getting blood flow in there, we don't have the healing and recovery happening because we've, we don't have oxygen and nutrients getting in there and flooding mm-hmm. those um, cells and tissues with the, all the good stuff that they need. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, they're, they're just fabulous. They really they sound I mean, really, I'm, really good. I can't believe I don't own a pair of these. It's going to be on my shopping list as soon as we get off this call. 
I think, for this yeah, season. Absolutely. I highly recommend, <laughs> highly recommend. Yeah, um, and Sarah Jane, how, how do they differ from other brands or, or conventional ice boots? Well, basically, like basically what I would say, is, what I do say to some people when they ask me about the difference, I say, well, depending on what you're trying to achieve for your horse, and uh, then if you're if you've just finished a cross country round or oh, and it's it's a warm or hot day and it was on firm ground, then absolutely get your standard ice boots out and ice those legs, but put your ice fives on afterwards, immediately after mm-hmm. you've iced, because you're unless you're going to walk your horse for 20 minutes in hand, if you want the horse to go and stand in the stable or in the tie-ups or whatever it is, and you've got other stuff to do, put your ice vibes on over the t- after you've done the standard icing in order to get the circulation going again, because horses need mm. to move to mm-hmm. have circulation in the lower legs. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not, you know, as you know, they're a bit different to um, the rest of us. Um, so in terms of difference, they, they just serve a different purpose. Uh, mm-hmm. And I won't use ice boots, monday to friday or actually to be honest i don't even own a pair but that is because i don't compete at any great level i would imagine but um <laughs> i use the boots and a lot of our customers are now using the boots without the cold packs every day or mm-hmm. every second day and it's mm-hmm. put them on before you ride while you're tacking up so that the leg is getting some blood flow and warming up and horses for you know horses that are maybe a bit prone to wind galls or um mm-hmm getting a bit of filling in their leg, just great for like that general good health maintenance of the legs to, you know, the longer the leg has filling sitting in it, the more stress those cells are under. So the more we can flush that out, the better. Mm. So would that be Um, good for horses that are like box 24 seven or are on some sort of box rest, like providing that it doesn't um, combine with an injury that doesn't need vibration, but would that be good to keep the circulation going? exactly exactly mm-hmm. that yes and uh, as you just mm-hmm. said yeah as long as it's not an injury that can't have vibration then they mm-hmm. they're absolutely ideal for that and i mean i was i did get to, i got to test a pair or to sample a pair before they actually went to market with um uh, an older he's retired now ex racehorse of mine who had um he'd a 30 percent correlation in his suspensory ligament and from we didn't, I'm not even sure what messing around in the paddock or something um, and uh, vet had done the scan wanted me to put him on box rest I don't know if these days they would necessarily go straight to box rest as much but that at that time it was box rest and then it was in hand walking but the whole time I actually had the ice fly boots on and mm-hmm. I um, used them through a protocol that um, the designer the inventor had actually given me for using them and mm-hmm. at the 12 week scan, my vet said to me, I, I actually need to pull up the previous scan. And he wanted to check the previous scan in order to make sure he hadn't misdiagnosed the first <laughs> time round, uh, because he was so impressed with how the injury had recovered or wow. was there a process of recovery. And at the 12 week mark, he said, well, if this was six months, I'd be telling you it's time now to get on board. You know, you've, you've been doing your in-hand walking and whatever, so now it's time to get on board and let's do a program over the next six weeks of a bit of walk and trot and whatever. That's but amazing. I was able to do that at 12 weeks as opposed to the um, 24 weeks that he was wow. expecting. Um, and look, the only difference was the use of the ice fly boots. Um, and at the time, we were obviously paying a lot of attention to what was going on, but at the time... Um, because he was on rest, I had no shoes on him, so mm-hmm. we were uh, trimming his um, farrier husband was trimming his feet and said how much hoof he was growing, <clears throat> which isn't normal for horses not moving around. Mm. But when he went to his back legs, his back feet, they had not grown at the same rate. Far from it, they were much more what you'd expect to see of a horse Whoa. that's not moving around. So that's learned, unreal. Like, yeah, I learned that I needed to be using them on both front and back, regardless of whether there was an injury. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. that's amazing. Well, they certainly mm. do have, like the, I find them, they're really easy to use. I really like that the the manufacturing is great and the fit is really good. So they're very snug. Um, yeah. And can I give my little tip? Because in Australia, sometimes it's so hot. 
I've used yes. two pairs of cells under one boot. So I get the large size and I turn one the right way and one the other way so they fit and I wrap them around. Yes. And they're still yep. really cold after the 20 minute cycle has finished, which yep. I love. And Sarah yep. Jane, they also come in a knee and a hock. Do they come in any other? Um, no, that's it. It's, anatomy it's full shapes. And full. Yeah, it's full mm -hmm. and extra full tendon boots, let's say, but they mm -hmm. do wrap under the, the fat lock a bit. And then there's the knee wraps mm -hmm. and the hock wraps and those are obviously specifically designed in order to get the cold yeah. and the vibration on the areas that yeah. you need them uh, yeah. and not to move to be comfortable for the horse to wear them yeah because we all know how, how much our horses want to stand still at times mm -hmm. um and yeah and the and what i would say is because we do get that question every so often about um you know for like 14 hand or 13 two jumping ponies mm -hmm. and i have put them on we have put them on jumping ponies before um to do a job and yes, mm -hmm. they'll be a bit long, but they're a wraparound style, so you can get them, you can pull them tight mm. or whatever. You can make it work. I don't know. I mean, I would love if they brought them out in a smaller size, really, but, but we can make the full size work on small ponies, so um, mm. that's what we run with. Mm. Yeah, I'm very, 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 very easy. always trying to um, injure themselves, aren't they? So it sounds like a must have, really, for any equestrian. Um, that, is, that is why I consider them. They, you should have them everyone should have them in their kit because they're just really yeah. and if you've got an older horse that's got a lot of miles on the clock then it's just good for their general health because it just actually helps them with it. even if they're mm. living out because obviously like here in Australia we do have turnout quite a lot like most horses are almost 24 7 basically turned out mm. so you would think they've got plenty of walking around but not necessarily and depending on where you are and what sort of access to paddocks you have they mightn't have huge spaces to wander um and then as i say with older horses they tend to not travel around the paddock as much so therefore you know a little any bit of extra help and a horse that maybe is doing work like a bit of dressage or whatever and they can get a bit i don't know what the technical word is uh but almost like a little bit tight in the back leg mm -hmm. so we look at muscles we get body workers out and they go oh it's tight in the glutes and tight in the the hamstrings mm. Mm. but sometimes there's a it, there's no injury in the tendons or the ligaments in the back legs there's no obvious problem but it's just a little bit tight and needs a little bit of help and that's literally just getting a bit more circulation like literally circulation is key to all things in life i believe like yeah. <laughs> our own skin our bodies us ourselves the more we move the better we are um, yes. And it's the same with those. So anything that we can use to help that, yeah. and and for it to be easy for us, is really key. Like you know, you're not going to use something every day if it's hard to use mm. or awkward. No, um, no, so not at all, easy. not at all. Well, that's amazing. Um, so yes, ice vibes definitely need to. Bex, they are definitely on your list for when we hop off this podcast. So Jane, the next range we have the Goodbye Flies range now flies in australia this is so welcomed um what are the range of products that you have in the goodbye flies range well goodbye flies they're um i i'm probably saying the wrong thing here but i actually use it more so for its nap it, because it's organic and it's really good for sensitive skinned horses so oh, i find awesome. it really good for itchy horses itchy horses or horses that have rubbed out a bit of hair and they need a bit of help growing oh. it back um, oh really yep Absolutely. Oh. And uh, so I really love, so we have their shampoo um, mm -hmm. and their show shine or six mm -hmm. in one grooming aid, depending on what you want to call it. And, um, but that's also, that is the fly repellent. But if you use the shampoo and the spray together, it actually gives you an extra benefit in terms of repelling the flies and the, and the mosquitoes and that sort of thing. And we've actually mm -hmm. had some really nice feedback from customers across Australia from different areas saying like, this actually has really helped. I mean, I know we do have some seriously tough fly and mosquito areas and yes. not everything is going to work um, but or, or work all the time. And it depends on the environment that is in. Is there lots of rain? Mm. Is it really dusty and dirty? But a good way flies, if you can use it on a regular basis, it's gentler on their skin. We don't we're not exposing them to loads of chemicals all of the time. Mm -hmm. And as a great for itchy horses and um and just yeah something nice I and mean, it brings up such a nice shine and the, sh the shampoo which mm -hmm. is ridiculous it's not it's not even purple shampoo but it makes like gray horses 
really white. Um, and white. I guess those tails really clean. It really cleans the tails. Which is lovely. And does it smell amazing um, as well? Well, I like it, but I'm mm -hmm. biased. So <laughs> it's actually a UK brand as well. It's from it's from a, uh, a little company in the UK, and it's all manufactured in the UK. I was going and, to say I've oh. seen it sponsoring a few classes over here. And I haven't been yes. lucky enough to try much of their products, but I'm really interested yeah. to hear about them more today because um, I did think yeah. that when I saw it as one of the products that we were going to discuss today, I thought, oh, that's interesting that it's made no, its way to Australia. Yeah, it's, it's, exactly. It's, it's a very interesting brand and, and really like it came about, which is the right way to, to have any products come into market or to whatever, is you do it, you design something because you've come across a problem and you haven't found a solution. So then mm. you try you try to figure out, well, what do I need? What do I, what do I need to make my horse's life better because of whatever issue is being experienced or what makes my life better and also my horse's life better? Um, mm -hmm. And that's where those, those the shampoo and the spray came from. They also have a dog range because there is, you know, you need dogs can, are different to horses, they have slightly different skin, slightly different things that they're allergic to or what sensitive mm -hmm. to. There is, we also carry the range for the dogs, shampoo and the spray. And um, which I quite like the coat shine spray for like not having to wash all the time, but just freshens mm. the coat a little bit, you know, a couple of Labradors mm. that love to roll everything that they find. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then we just recently brought in their Equizen, which is this, I don't believe there's anything else like it on the market uh, to the best of my knowledge, but it's a bar of, essential oil type stuff and calming stuff and it you cable tie it or you fix it to your tie up area or your stable or wherever your horse is spending out of time maybe in the truck or the float or the horse box i should say for <laughs> uk listeners <laughs> and um it uh just basically helps them relax it's like me going to bed with lavender spray or something oh, wow. um, it helps oh um, it just really helps, and they will go to it once they get used to it, and they see they will actually move to be near it um, mm. in the stable. Um, just That's to, so interesting. It's it's really interesting, yeah. Uh, mm. I say it's just in. So um, we've just had a couple of customers contact us last week to say that they just really loved the change in their horse. So and oh. I do believe. I don't know. Um, we haven't got obviously we've just got it here, so we haven't done a huge amount with it. But I know in the UK. Mm. It had great success with um, racehorses using it right. and, um, you know, fillies that are a little bit stressed or colts being a bit mm. too cold. Well, I think so, there's yeah, a lot yeah. to be said for all these kind of oils that people, I mean, if you go back yeah. to, like, um, I don't know, India yoga times and they're, they're burning incense and things like that. Yeah. And there's lots of different smells yeah. and scents that actually do make, do calm us down or bring back a nice exactly. memory. So mm. So yeah, it and does I, make and sense. I like. I always like to look for something, something new and different, but without it being like just new for the sake of being new. Something that actually mm. Um, mm. does something be of benefit, and we don't always want to add another powder or a serene or whatever it is that we might want to do to help our horses. So sometimes, mm. if we can't change other things, then something that's so non-invasive. I mean, it's mm. just. It's mm. literally just something nice for them to smell and feel relaxed. And there's also like a, it's a liquid in a an applicator which you can wipe around the muzzle, like around mm -hmm. the outside of the nostrils. So just mm -hmm. before you, and it's FEI compliant, doesn't swab or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's perfectly. Is that the um, same with all their products? Are they all FEI compliant? It is. Yes, all all the products are FEI. I do know. I only discovered that recently. Actually, there's some fly repellent type stuff out there that does actually swab. Um, oh wow! Well. Yeah, I, I literally, I literally only discovered that like four days ago when I was trying to buy. Not that I managed to me, but I was thinking of how many people who do compete, um, you know, under rules. Yeah, stuff. yeah, it's a real but, thing. Uh, it is. Yeah. I mean, you've got to be really careful when buying these products for um, your horses, especially mm. if you want to compete international under international rules. Mm. So that's great. Yeah, exactly. That's a great plus for Goodbye Fies, as well as them being really natural and coming at a slightly yeah. different mm -hmm. angle as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, you you sold me a, you sold me at whitening. Now I have two greys in the team. <laughs> whitening and getting rid of flies and organic with you know uh, products yeah. that are actually good for the skin. I think I think I need to make a little order, Sarah Jane. 
because yeah. you know <laughs> we, we know how we know how i love a leader accessory little pack we won't talk <laughs> oh my god we'll talk about them after this um so the next the next sort of products you are stocking are the ps of sweden range now these have been really well marketed and advertised and look like they're going great guns why do you love the ps of sweden range well this is an interesting one so PS have done a, an amazing job. They, they started, I, I, I hope I don't get this wrong, but I think it was like 2010, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And they have done an amazing job of uh, going to the market with beautiful products um, and really lovely products. I mm -hmm. am very functional and very practical. So when we initially were approached about doing the PS of Sweden thing, I was a bit like, I don't know if this fits for me and for what we do at Leader Equine. Um, but then I realized um, just because I like things to be practical and functional doesn't mean that they have to not be pretty. I can also have pretty. You can do everything. You can have it all, Sarah Jane, you can have it all. And just for our listeners, you can explain to them the PS of Sweden if they haven't heard of them. That they're like a complete range, aren't they? From everything from saddle pads they, to bridles. Yeah, so they're, uh, they're Swedish, as the name would suggest, they're a Swedish brand. They started off with um, anatomical bridles and they do a, a lovely, very in-depth range of, of bridles for mm -hmm. uh, dressage and jumping um, or even crossover. And uh, with, you know, both headpiece, nose pieces, the leather itself is, is very nice and beautiful, actually. And really lightweight actually very very lightweight oh, is it? funny enough i was just having this thought yesterday when i was riding my horse has literally just come back into work and i was looking at the pole of my good mare and she doesn't have an anatomical bridle is that how you say it yeah anatomical yes bridle so um it's not cut away at the ears and it's not got any <laughs> soft padding but when she's competing she actually has quite a heavy bit like she goes in like a kimble wick a metal bit and i always think that's putting quite a bit of pressure on her pole and it was only yesterday when i was riding around i thought i must find a good bridle that is going to be more comfortable for her so you're saying that it's lightweight another thing i'm going to, have to put yeah. on my shopping list <laughs> yeah oh my god they do they also in their bridles they have this thing with the um the cheek straps that connect to the bit they have like little elastic cradles inside the leather which oh. you can choose to use or not use but what that does is just gives this like little spongy give so the, mm. the bit ring isn't just sitting on the leather. There's like this yeah. little like, yeah, just this like, little bit of give. Oh, wow. Which for, I mean, I'm quite sure you need to have nice hands and maybe, you know, I, I don't know. I, um, I like it. I think anything that makes something softer is what I Yeah, like. and a little bit more malleable. Yeah. And have some movement. More comfortable. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be more comfortable. Exactly. Right. But that's where they that's, they started with the bridles and then they went to um, saddle pads. And I think I, I am pretty confident in saying that they are the first saddle pad brand that did these stock cushions. So you don't have to use straps at the front of the saddle pad. And they just, I mean, they're, I mean, yeah, just incredible how they sort of took over the matchy matchy or drove the matchy matchy. Oh. I do think they could be held responsible for a lot of what's going on and in the horse world mm -hmm. definitely they've done an incredible job i quite like them because they're very brave they're not afraid to try mm -hmm. something different mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and uh you know just try different things different colors different designs different fabrics mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um and the rider wear the clothing uh, i find it quite difficult to get breeches to fit nicely mm -hmm. i have this weird like upside down triangle shape so uh, <laughs> most breeches if I get them to fit my waist they're too big on my hips and my knees and then mm -hmm. if I get them to fit my legs um it's cutting off circulation around my middle so, <laughs> um, you're painting a great picture breeches. I almost want you to get up and give yeah. us a twirl <laughs> <laughs> um and I quite like theirs because they seem to fit a, a you know basically we can find a fit for there's lots of different styles and yeah so we can we put lots of choice available there um mm. from their leg wear but yeah so that's they're a great brand for covering all bases for the for the rider and, mm, and what about the like, really... like... sorry Vic. so it sounds like the really um innovative and as you say brave that's what we like in the horse brands is the moving forward and always pushing to see what's the next best thing 
that's it because we can get too hung up on just you know um we don't want the same same all the time mm. like we it's good to have change and it's sometimes yes you can be brave and you can fail but it's better to try things than not to try them um and thinking of that the opponent grooming products i have several of these and i'm obsessed with the tiger tongue sponges and the tiger tongue cross normal sponge um oh, can you I give know. us a run through of the products there i am literally <laughs> obsessed with that sponge <laughs> so the opponent stuff is exactly my kind of thing so really easy does an amazing job covers lots of bases i have a beautiful set of Haas grooming brushes in my mm -hmm. tech room that have not seen the light of day in at least two years because I use the Epona, I use the flexible glossy, what is it called? Flexible glossy groomer, which is yep. like a rubber curry comb, but it's just not any rubber curry comb. It's just really lovely. It sits in your hand. Stuff. It yeah, really it sort of in cups your into your hand. Yeah, and it has that little crease halfway, so you can really get yep. around like knees and hocks exactly. and it's you soft enough. You can use it over their hocks. Yeah. You know, when the, that's, that's where the mud gets caked on and you're trying to break it up um mm. all of those points and they don't react and I, I do have a you know as well i think maybe we all say we have sensitive horses but i think this is one of the most sensitive horses i have and uh he's come he doesn't react he just it's really comfortable it's like a little massage the the tiger's mm. tongue sponge or the horse groomer that's in place of a dandy brush in place of a body brush mm. Mm. it's just great you can use it wet or dry most often i use it dry and then mm -hmm. Have the power shower i mean it, the power shower sponge is this super absorbent sponge on one side tiger's tongue on the other it's just mm -hmm. ideal yeah. for wash days um, so good and the new one is the the mane and tail uh the queen's brush it's called queen's brush mm -hmm. mane and tail uh brush and that is i was like i felt it and i played with it and i was like is this going to be good? <laughs> I mean, all the good but is ah. this going to be good and i go out and we brush muddy tails and dusty tails and mm. tails that are full of stuff that like fly repellent and then dust is stuck to it and whatever else. Mm. And, um, and it's just, it is really good and so much less breakage. It's incredible. Yeah. So much less, like it's just tails are much healthier using those. It's fantastic brush. So um, it's another I'm great brand that again have been really great. Um, yeah, I'm afraid of sounding too passionate about them. But they genuinely <laughs> really are really good. Like I just I'm I am one of those weird fanatics, I think, but they're just are so good and um thankfully I always get awesome feedback from people. I'm just like, you have to try this and then they're like, Oh my god, yes, this is really good. Yeah. No, they they are great. And the little what's it called? The flower the little flower power. The shed flower, right? yes, for the for de shedding. You are so good. So whenever you need to get winter coat out, and I also use it to like brush off the inside of saddle cloths and boots and inside of rugs, and it just fits That's in funny. your hand like a little blue flower. And like I can, you can also exactly. clean your your body brush with it. Oh my god, I get excited. I think I get obsessed as well. We can we can have a party <laughs> with all the products. You two need a podcast. I mean, stop talking about your products. <laughs> It's the sponge. I just want to talk about the sponge. It's, like, as a, I, it's me as a person, as a horse rider, first, and that's what's really mm. important for us as a leader uh, is think about like what makes us, because we love spending time with our horses. So we want to have stuff that is useful, functional, does a great job, looks good if, if at all possible. And yeah, the shed flower, I mean, that's super cool little tool for the mm. de shedding season. And mm. absolutely, because I only have one wash machine. So Saddle pads have to be washed in my Ooh. normal. Oh. So I just come out with the shed fire, I take the hair off, and I'm like, can't complain. There is less yeah. hair in the <laughs> than there is in my clothes from the Labradors. So. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, it's such good products. And there's just so many various different tools. And you're right, they're all like, it's the kind of thing that a horse person, like tested by horse people, and is really practical. And it's yeah. not just a copy of something else. They're all really different. They're all super useful. And yeah, everyone needs to get onto them. Bex, put them on your list. Another thing for my list. Another thing for my list. No, they all sound yeah. like, again, another um, brand that's been really brave and been really out there. And they've developed what we use every day to make it better. So that's, yeah. you can Absolutely. ask anyone. You can just see the way you talk about it, how passionate you are that it actually works yeah. as well. <laughs> so yeah. one subject I've been really desperate to get onto today 
And I know it's going to be a big debate between lots of people. I mean, well, I'm in the middle of winter at the moment. Amanda's in the middle of summer. And that is the topic of rugging. So it's a largely debated top topic. So can you give me a little bit of advice um, for when it comes to choosing the right rug for your horse? Let's start there. Right. So <clears throat> first of all, uh, horses do not feel the weather changes as quickly as we do. Okay. <laughs> really? Please. <laughs> Sarah Jane, I think I heard a comment that when you came to Australia, you were like, these people live in a hot country and the amount of rugs they put on their horses is ridiculous. <laughs> I'm sure my horses have thermometers in the stable and know when it goes from zero to minus zero to minus one. They know when it increases by four degrees. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> don't know about that um, <laughs> look i i've always worked with um you know it, prior to this sort of thing i've you know worked with racehorses and stuff who would have been stabled a lot would have you been clipped through winter we would have had to use very warm rugs because standing in a stable it's not as warm as moving around a paddock and certainly with a clipped coat there needs to be a replacement of that coat um and also to any performance horses in general they through winter you don't want them burning excess um feed and, and weight by keeping themselves warm so mm -hmm. you want to be able to manage that within reason and rugs will help you do that and uh so yeah so look first things first is yes remember that they don't feel the weather changes as much as us um the other the other side to that is making sure that you're picking a rug that they are comfortable in for a wider variety of weather changes so we live i live in melbourne the weather fluctuates wildly so i'm very <laughs> conscious of having something that um will allow my horse to be comfortable if it drops below a certain temperature but isn't going to overheat him as it gets warmer i do get it's it, there has to be a little bit of personal responsibility so you have to get to know your horse how are they reacting? How do they behave um, and different things? And, and my horses do have to put up with being test subjects quite often because what works for one horse will not necessarily work for another. And um, I was being very strict about I'm not over rugging. I'm not going to be, you know, not listening to my own advice. And and then I a few days, I, this was in winter and a few days looking at my horse, I went, I am under rugging this guy. I've got to, I've actually oh. need to change this. He is feeling it a bit more. Maybe it's because he's an older horse and older horses can, um, they can struggle a little bit to regulate their, their temperature. They can feel mm -hmm. the weather a bit more. And they can be, um, sometimes they can just be warmer when they're not meant to be warmer and they can feel the cold when you're not thinking they're gonna feel the cold. So it's, a, it's important to be on top of that. It also means obviously potentially changing rugs more often. If you, can't change rugs really often or regularly, then you're better to rug lighter to feed more hay and just, mm -hmm. just accept it. As yeah, as that's a really good bit of advice that I was taught a long time yeah. ago, that as long as they've got plenty of roughage and are always kind of eating, then yeah, yeah not to over rug because yes. you'll end up with a sweaty, yeah. ashy horse. If you've got a horse that's living out, yeah, mm. if you've got a horse that's living out and they're not doing a lot of work, so mm. you don't need them to be clean and dry when you bring them in to ride or whatever the case may be then mm. they may well be absolutely fine with lots of hay and uh, and shelter if it's windy and raining and they've got no shelter they might be better with something on and mm. one thing to keep an eye on because i think we just typically go for like warm rugs immediately in winter we sort of go for the we reach for the 200 or the 300 very quickly um that is you know actually a 50 gram is a really good option it's better than a zero sheet because mm -hmm. it has a little bit of loft with 50 gram fill allows a little bit more mm -hmm. air to travel around um and yeah great option for that sort of um when you want to just give them a little bit of additional protection when they're out in the paddock but you want to avoid over rugging Mm. Yeah. Can you explain, Sarah Jane, the difference between like 100, 200, 300, 400, like what that number means and um, when you might use those? So the, that, that gram 
co that measurement comes from the amount, the, the way the fill weighs per square mm -hmm. inch. I think I'm right saying square oh, inch. Okay. Um, yeah. And but yeah, it's just basically the, the weight of what, if you chopped up a square inch of the fill and put it on the scales, mm -hmm. it'll be um, 400 gram or 300 gram or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yep. 400 is really not a common thing for Australia, but probably a bit more common for the UK and Ireland. I certainly. Will, I, I'm just going to put my hand up and say, so my horses were, went from being competition horses and then I took a few weeks off over the winter. Um, so they all got turned out in the field. They were clipped. So um, I went and bought them a whole new wardrobe and I got them some 400 grams. But it was getting down here to like minus three things like that but they were snug they were good but it was really confusing for me because I've never bought anything that heavy and I was thinking oh are they going to be okay um they, they seem to work really well but also another thing which confused me a little bit was the um den de denier of how yep. tough the fabric is um can you talk us yes. a little bit through that yeah sure so when you're talking about fill there um Obviously, the horseway rugs have a liner system. They were the first to introduce a, a liner system, and thank and other people are getting onto it. But liner systems are mm. super beneficial to allow you to change the weight of your rug without having lots of different top rugs. Uh, mm. So you can start with a lighter rug and just add different weights of liners as you need. Um, the fill, I do find that we don't. It, the what am I trying to say? The less we layer rugs, the better and more comfortable our horse is going to be. So having a rug with fill on and nothing else under, the horse is going to be more comfortable, have better breathability, more uh, and uh, better warmth and comfort, basically wearing that rug, than if they had a sheet and then a fleece or a wool sort of rug and then another and then a top rug and it just gets heavy. There's lots of straps. It's, you mm. know. And that's what we used to do in the old days, wasn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, yes. yeah, yes. yes. Yeah, layers of woolen rugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm. And look, mm. it had its place, mm. and it still will. And absolutely, I'm sure there are people still functioning really well with that. But it's uh, how many? Is it easy for you to change lots of straps and rugs and adjust those things, or you know, uh, can we make it a bit easier? And as I say, lighter on the horse, even picking mm. up the rug. How how heavy does your rug feel? And then your horse is wearing that. And can we have lighter fabrics without losing other aspects of it? So that will bring me to mm. denier. The difference in denier, so we typically see 600 and 1200 and 1680 as measurements um, of denier in the uh, horse rug world. Denier is mm -hmm. the width of the yarn. So it's ah. um, it was what they're talking about is just the width of the yarn. And then, so mm -hmm. when that's woven together, so a 600D is quite a thin yarn, 1200D is twice that width, 1680 is a bit more again. Ah. Mm -hmm. What can be um, important is that, not that it gets talked about, but it's just one of those weird little facts that I'll just share because I know it. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you can get 1200D rugs that are two 600D yarns wound together, but the rip oh. strength of that rug will not be as strong as a rug that uses just a 1200D actual yarn right okay that's interesting it a d rug but it's actually two 600 d yarns together so um, shaky well i mean look it's it functions it, it does a job but it's and it's not something that you could ever specify to anybody because at the end of the day it's still a 1200d but it's when you test the rip yeah. strength of things then you find that the straight 1200d will not break as quickly as the the um the two mm. 600s wound together mm. um and then fun fact denier is is, is important it's not always good to go for the tough denier the bigger the higher the denier the more strength is if you have a horse that's not a rug wrecker and has nice fencing and whatever else then you don't really have to go for the heavier denier and you'll find that lighter denier or um 600s or 1200s they're a bit lighter on the horse to wear and mm -hmm. you usually get better breathability with uh those as, as the further up you go the harder it is to cope with waterproofing um and so it's finding a balance what's the most important factor first for your rug mm -hmm. and then one of the next most important and trying to find a balance that suits you i always mm -hmm. think that the that's the, really interesting yeah the thing with always goes on my head when i'm buying rugs the, the denier i always think if you get the lesser one then it's not going to be as waterproof i'm obviously talking about a turnout rug here no 
that no, it makes it that's difference. well that's actually a bit of a, like a myth type thing yeah so your your 600d um can be just as waterproof as your 1200 or your 1680 if it's in fact sometimes your 1680 might be as waterproof mm. as your 600 oh. if you have fill like a good chunk of fill in your 1680d you probably won't notice if it maybe lets a little bit of water in, if it's been torrential rain overnight or for 24 hours or whatever, you won't notice if the fill is there because the fill kind of catches it and then the horse is warm and that that warm air rising from the horse's body dries the fill out. So then it never actually reaches the horse. So it's fine. It's still a waterproof rug, still doing a job. Mm. But obviously for like light rain sheets and uh, lighter turnouts, you don't have as much fill there. So you must make sure that they're waterproof. And... The six hundred D coats very well because it's very smooth, it's very smooth fabric. So it's it's it should be good to uh, waterproof. Which uh, so actually the hero, the Amigo Hero range that Horsewear do is is actually a really excellent six hundred D rug um, because of that because mm -hmm. it's very breathable. It's just this six hundred D fabric. It's very light and then it's very waterproof. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So interesting, so interesting. So many little nuggets there I had no idea about. And it's gonna make a difference when I'm even buying rugs. Um, so how about breathability? <laughs> you, you just talked a little bit about that just now. I mean, how can a rug help this? I know you've just spoken about um, when you've got more yeah. fill, then it can capture the rain. Um, and you mentioned mm. as well, in the old days we used to layer them. And I always thought, you know, your mum always said, put on loads of layers, you're gonna keep warmer. So. I would do yeah. this and old yards years ago i'd do this but you're right i mean the weight then you've got on the horses it makes a big difference so mm. um, and if you think of us we tend to put on like a puffy jacket now we don't necessarily layer mm. on yeah. lots of sleeves and things we want to like we want to keep movement available to us and we want to be comfortable and we also leave so things on horses so mm. if you've got mm. three or four layers and they don't all fit well together, then you can end up with an inadvertent rubbing problem mm. um, because something doesn't fit mm. with something else or because it's not been designed to be layered over that and we've put it together, mm -hmm. then we can cause problems or different fabrics together, they'll stick. So the, and I, I like that with the um, lining that we use where it, it will slip over the horse's coat. It doesn't catch the coat um sort of in, mm -hmm. the shine sometimes on the coat and it's antibacterial so it's good for their skin but it will if the horse rolls um and the horse and the rug somehow moves it will actually once once they start walking that's a little bit of a unique horse wear design once mm -hmm. they start walking it self corrects it back mm -hmm. to where it should oh, be wow. um, which yeah, but cool. they don't ever slip to the side i've never had one that is not sitting straight no well this is exactly well, that's exactly it and i have said yeah that's because i mean you see they just kind of wiggle the way back they're so smooth yes. mm -hmm. you can see you can watch a horse roll and the rug goes right round to the side and i'm thinking there's no way that one can fix itself and then he leaps up from the ground he has a buck and a rear and he canters <laughs> off and i'm like how is that rug straight now but yeah. it is so it's yeah. i mean i love it awesome for that so mm -hmm. breathability in a rug um it's they'll all say they're breathable they're breathable because they should be and if you pick mm. up a rug and you blow through the fabric you should be able to blow through it um yeah. from the inside to the mm -hmm. um outside yeah um and what really it comes down to is how breathability is determined by how much moisture can and air can pass through that fabric while it's raining so right um, probably not explaining that very well i don't think but um you want you will lose a certain amount of breathability the uh more waterproof you make something mm -hmm. if right. you don't also use particularly um good good's a very boring word but waterproof <laughs> coating you want to have a very good waterproof coating that allows um transfer of moisture in order to uh, improve the breathability so air can move between it's also like the, the fill would help help it be breathable i'm thinking about like you guys in australia when it's chucking it down mm. with rain but it's actually really warm so you want to put something on mm. your horse but you don't have your fill but you you, yeah. you don't want them to be sweating you know when it's warm but you want to well, keep them dry there is something that's that's maybe maybe you pick up maybe you pick one of the styles that's waterproof across the top and has mesh panels but ah. sometimes even those even those rugs here 
when it's humid can have the wrong effect because you know you end up with um issues under the top of the rug on the skin but um one of the best ones i've seen to cope with that is the rambo summer series turnout because it's actually using a soft shell fabric like a genuine soft shell mm. technical fabric that you would expect in your north face jacket or your yeah. Kathmandu or whatever yeah. your sp- whatever sporty fabric you're using to climb mountains in that's the mm. kind of fabric that the rambo summer series use so it's very very waterproof but extremely breathable and even again my horses get to test these things so i'll put it on it's going to be 30 degrees at some stage um but there's also a lot of rain coming through i'm thinking okay let's see and i'll check it every so often no still no sweat still no sweat no Mm. very comfortable horse it buckets down i'm thinking there's no way that that piece of fabric has been waterproof enough to hold that amount of rain and then i peel it back and there he is he's totally dry across his back and he's been comfortable and Mm. i can still get a ride in if it has stopped raining um so yeah it's a really versatile rug you do lose the strength with that fabric because it is like a sporty technical fabric so if you've got a horse that's going to rub up against sharp objects or fight with somebody else then Mm. it won't be as long lasting as a standard rambo turnout or amigo turnout um Mm -hmm. but if your number one priority in that situation is breathability for those sort of weather fluctuations that we get then it's the way to go um and it also comes even with a little 100 gram liner that sits at the top yeah it's a really cool idea it's super like super for like when you're changing seasons and Mm -hmm. Or you can't get out to change your rugs really often. So great for leaving on them because they can still regulate their temperature because they've got the mesh panels along the, the sides mm. and under the neck. Um, but you're keeping the top of their back comfortable, warm. Mm. Um, mm. And uh, so, yeah, no, really super little rug. Mm. How lucky are our horses? <laughs> Just thinking oh about all God. this. So lucky. The massive range, the wardrobes that they have and how they're always we're always moving forward and developing. It's just mad, isn't it? So lucky. What What about cotton sheets? So, Sarah Jane, I know you and I have talked about this quite a bit. That in Australia, the cotton sheets um, with hoods and tail bags are a very much Australian thing, not so much a European thing. So, is um, is Australia the country that puts cotton sheets underneath? Do they do it in Europe? And should we do it? Is there a pro? pro are there pros and cons for that? Well, so I've now been here long enough to have experienced a few different seasons, a few different years with horses and the different weathers that we get in Australia. And mm-hmm. again, test out these things that I've never seen before. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the, the tail bag thing, I, I do understand it because obviously we have horses that are going to shows, going to competitions. And again, because as I said earlier, horses tend to be turned out 24 seven in Australia quite often. It's, it, you know, the adjustments are livery yards. It's pretty much all turnout. Um, and, you know, obviously a few of us are maybe lucky enough. I don't have stables, but if, if you're lucky enough to have stables, then obviously you'll, you'll make use of them. But for the most part, our horses are living out, which means that they're getting, and we have a lot of dust at times. We have floods, mm. then we have mm. dust, and we have lots of things going on. So tail bags, I guess I understand the the whole point of it keeps the tail and I see the results to see people with amazing mm-hmm. tails yep. <laughs> um, so they obviously serve a, a function I think I've, I'm too long on the tooth to switch over to using tail bags oh come on I'll, um, I'll do it I'll do it I'll bet you if you put a tail bag on for six months every day that tail could even double I swear by tail bags. Really you could. <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen an improvement in the last three months using my show shine and my queen's mane and tail brush. <laughs> with my lovely little turban. Same uh, results. But it also different path, girls. Yeah. It's different it's path. So improved. Like, and it, the tail bag could absolutely, I mean, I imagine it would make an amazing difference to it. Mm-hmm. But, um, and the hood thing, I also, I understand that it, I, I mean, we do have, we use like slinky hoods at home. Uh, in you know Ireland, UK, Europe, uh, but not so much cotton hoods, and certainly not turned out. That's that's yeah. a very Australian thing. Like, yeah. but we have a lot of sunburn as well. Like their coats get really, really tanned off, don't they? And their tails. Yes, and it is, and it, and it's it, it, it's very sunny at times, or it's very hot, and there's a, there is high UV here compared to other areas of the world, which does put everything under much more pressure. Um, mm. A horse's skin. 
their white bits, their whatever, their coat, mm. even, even a horse mm. with the best diet um, can still get a coat that looks like it's not great, but that's Blaged. because the sun itself is clean. Yeah, well, the sun is yes. burning. You can even see the hair like curling up a bit. Mm -hmm. And that's from like one or two days of just it, the horse standing in the paddock baking, mm -hmm. um, which is, so this summer I was experimenting. I was using the Rambo Natura summer sheet because it's mm -hmm. a 100% cotton, 100% 100% cotton and hemp blend. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, beautiful fabric. I would love to have bed sheets that feel as nice. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, really breathable and it gave me that protection because I, I was noticing that on, a, on a, the last couple of summers with um, my other horses, just that little bit of burning almost of the hair it sounds terrible but i was just like what is going on and now i've learned yeah i, I just ha i just need a little bit more um protection mm. for the horses so yeah the sun is really the sun is hard here it is it, it, we people at home in ireland laugh at me saying it's harsh conditions here because they just think <laughs> we live on a beach or something but i'm like no yeah. it's not quite like that <laughs> <laughs> don't want to do that so, and what's yeah. your thoughts for um, people um yeah, well, I was going to say cotton sheets under rugs, um, I think is a very Australian thing. I don't, I mean, Bex, you might tell me something different. But Well, we would put a cotton sheet underneath, um, say, the stable rugs, because then I find it's less washing of the stable rugs than we just wash the yeah. cotton sheet. Yeah, yeah. Yes. it's like pajamas. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, maybe I haven't used enough other brands to have needed that or or i'm just really not a washer of rugs but the, <laughs> i've used washer rugs for so long so back when i was working in racing yards we st we were using horsehair rugs and then i just when i had horses i was i was lucky enough to be able to get hold of these horsehair rugs when i was working in the shop and with horsehair and everything else so i haven't really mm -hmm. used since i was a kid i haven't really used other brands but the lining in horseware is so antibacterial that it doesn't get as sweaty or smelly or rubby. Yeah. rubby. Um, so you can get away with a lot less washing. So then I've never had a need for putting a cotton sheet underneath to keep the top rug clean. I just mm -hmm. wash the rug at the end of the season and wow. that does the job. And actually that's true. Um, now you've brought it up, the newer rugs that I have bought, I don't probably won't yeah. wash them as much um, and they don't get yes. as grease underneath. Um, so no, yeah. that is true, and that's something that I'll keep in mind actually for next winter. That the newer rugs probably don't need to have a sheet underneath because it does sometimes cause rubs on the shoulders. So they end up putting a bandage yeah, down the front if it's of their not neck. Causing, and... If it's not causing a rub and you like using it, there's nothing mm. wrong with it. It's mm. it, it really comes down to a little bit of personal choice and what you like doing for your horses and what works mm. for you. Um, certainly here, because our horses turn out a lot, we have fluctuations in the weather, so we might have a cotton sheet on a horse here with a turnout over the top at night time, but then we know during the day it's not going to rain. Um, so the top rug can come off and they still have a cotton sheet and it doesn't require somebody pulling rugs off and putting rugs on. It's like a one rug mm. change kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Um, so there, there, there's a place for it, but it's yeah. not a necessity. You don't have to do it. Yeah, yeah. So one of the big questions for me um, uh, is all uh, rug sizing, rug fitting. We all know that some people have a cob which is as wide as a barrel, or so let's have a 17 pound <laughs> horse that's skinny as a plank. Um, how do you determine the correct sizing for your horse and rugs? Uh, usually with a humongous amount of mathematical equations to be worked out. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, I think the best measurement to use is always center of the chest, around the point mm -hmm. of the shoulder, along the body, to the center of the tail. Then we take 10 centimeters off that measurement mm -hmm. and we have a look at the size chart that, well, in particular, well, we obviously look at horseware in particular, and mm -hmm. um, we look at the size chart and where does that measurement fit? And if it's in between two sizes, I usually pick the bigger size. Mm -hmm. um, some rug designs so horse will have a few different patterns of fit so uh, and front closure systems which can slightly affect only slightly affect mm -hmm. the fit mm -hmm. so some styles i might size down depending on my horse but by and large once you've got your size you you mm -hmm. go with that size um mm -hmm. but uh yeah so sizing the center of the chest measure, to the middle yeah, of the tail the chest, 
around the country. I've never known that in my 30 odd years of doing horses. <laughs> yeah. It's the best way to do it because quite often we look, we see rugs and quite a few European brands do this where they measure, they look at the wither to the top of the tail. But Ooh. that doesn't work for when you have thoroughbreds and warm bloods and mm. cobs, that wither to tail measurement can be really inaccurate when it comes to the build of the horse mm. in front and even for big bummed horses, you know, like mm. it, you can go up a size. It doesn't affect it, that length gets taken up in the shoulder. So even though yeah. horse, maybe you think yes. it's a six three, put the six six on and it yeah, that fills the um the length out. That's so true, isn't it? Like the width from the mm. center of the chest just around to the shoulder. Like you think there's so much yes. rug that can be taken up in the front. And also I suppose it's like the neck fit's really important, isn't it? It's like that there's enough room yes. for them to actually graze and put their head down without pulling their rug up from the back and so, burying their bum. Exactly. Mm. Absolutely. And then you don't want it so your your rug is sitting forward, like a horse would tend to cut the rug quite forward cut. Um so yeah. And that is obviously to take pressure of wither because you don't want to. That means if you do happen to buy a rug that's too big, it probably still won't move. It's probably very comfortable on your horse because it's not going to slip back over the wither. Mm. They're designed not to do that. And quite often, when I was um, working with the R and D department or whatever, I'd get handed sample rugs to go and try. But I very rarely got a sample rug that was actually my horse's size. Yeah, so he no. lived in. He he was like a sixteen one thoroughbred. He was living in six foot nine rugs for most of his life because <laughs> yeah. that's what I was given it didn't cost me I was like well I'm not yeah that's great that's always a win um, yeah. they were just they were they sat on them they just they, you could see that they were too big you could see it was too long but then yeah. I could test that waterproofing and whatever else they were looking for me to test maybe the hood fit or the where the leg arch was or whatever and they want to see it on different horses they want to see the wrong size on a different horse to see mm. what happens to the rug what way does it move um, yeah. But yeah, it didn't it, it work well. So he's That's lived so his life in oh, such a massive pajamas, your horse. Lucky, lucky <laughs> boy. <laughs> now, that now that he's retired and I have, I have to buy his rugs for him, um, he gets he gets the correct size now. He does wear his, his six foot sixes now. Um, he's probably disappointed he's not going for that cool boyo look anymore. Like, what <laughs> is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Today has been really interesting speaking to you, Sarah Jane. So thank you so much for coming on and speaking about all these really super cool products. Um, I mean, I know I've got a shopping list from this episode. And how about you, Amanda? Always. And Sarah Jane knows I always have a shopping list for Horseway. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It's been, it's been absolutely lovely to be talking to you both. Yeah, well, thank you very much. So this has been the Equestrian Experience with myself, Bex Mason, my co-host, Amanda Ross, and this episode's guest, Sarah Jane Cahoon. To send in your questions for up and coming episodes, enter our competitions and access our other episodes, be sure to visit the Equestrian Experience Podcast.com. You can also follow us at Bex Mason SJ and at Amanda Ross Equestrian and find Sarah Jane at her full range at leaderequine.com.au. So until next time, have a great equestrian experience. <laughs>